everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, I'm gonna talk about inverse trigonometric functions. So this is gonna be a good introduction. You know, definitions, domain, range, some basic examples, all that stuff of inverse trig functions. So if you need a review of what just inverse functions are in general, you can click up here. I have a couple videos on those. But remember, if we have some original function and its inverse function, basically what the inverse function does is it reverses everything or undoes everything the original function does, okay? And the domain of our original function is now the range of our inverse function. The range of our original function is now the domain of the inverse function. And in general, all the inputs and outputs just sort of switch, okay? So remembering that, let's look at inverse trig functions. So first of all, notation. I prefer this notation, we do see both, the arc sine x, but I prefer just this inverse notation. So for all my videos, I'm gonna be using this, but I do wanna show that this is a thing that people use. So remember, since all our inputs and outputs switch, our input is now a value and our output is an angle. So this is a cool thing we can look at, and sometimes we even rewrite whatever problem we have if we're like evaluating an inverse trig function. We can rewrite it like this and say equals theta, because we know that this is some angle that's what our output is right so this is like asking what angle gives me this value for sine okay so let's think about like one half what angle gives me one half for sine in other words what theta can i plug into that original sine x function that will give me one half well you can see that we have a problem here right there is a problem and this is really the only tricky part is remembering the range because think about it there are infinitely many angles I can plug in to get one half. I can plug in pi over six, but I can also add or subtract any multiple of two pi and plug that in and get one half, right? So there's a big problem, and that's why we need to remember that to have an inverse of function must be one to one, and this is the exact reason why, okay? Looking at this graph, remember how we can test for one to one? The horizontal line test, I can draw a horizontal line and if it intersects at two or more points then the function is not one to one. Both these graphs for sine and cosine fail the horizontal line test miserably, infinitely many times, right? It'll just keep intersecting. So what we can do is we can restrict the domain of these functions. Basically what we can do is come in and say, okay, well if I restrict the domain of these functions to a certain interval, the function is now one-to-one, -one, and I can take the inverse with this new restricted domain, which will now restrict the range of our inverse, because the domain of the original is the range of the inverse, right? But that's actually what we want. We want to restrict the range of the inverse, because remember, evaluating something like this for one-half, I, I could get infinitely many answers. We don't want that. So by restricting this, we will have one and only one answer. So how do we restrict, restrict this? and? Again, we, we do have to kind of get some memorizing unless you want to draw a sketch every time, but basically I just cut this off. I think of cutting this off to make it one-to-one. -one. So if I cut off here and here, right, and I'll even erase everything around it. Now you can see that this cosine function passes the horizontal line test. If I cut off here and here, okay, and now this interval that I've restricted cosine to, the domain of this cosine function, my marker's breaking here, is on this interval from zero to pi, okay, including pi. So that means that the range of the inverse cosine, right, the range of cosine inverse is from zero to pi. So that's where these restricted ranges that we have to remember come from. And I always remind students of that so you don't just have to blindly memorize a bunch of ranges. You can, you know, if you understand where these come from, then if you ever forget them, you can maybe draw a little sketch and see, okay, how can I make this one to one? Well, I can cut off here at negative pi over two and here at positive pi over two, right? And if I erase everything around it, now my sine function is one to one. And now I could take an inverse. And maybe you think to yourself, okay, well, there's other points. What if I cut off that and made it one-to-one? -one? Well, you could, but as math people, we have just agreed on this interval because it makes the most sense. It's close to zero, and yeah, we've agreed on this. So negative pi over two to pi over two. I'm just kind of showing why, right? Because now the domain that we've restricted this sine function to is from negative pi over two to pi over two 
which means that the range of sine inverse is going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And you can do this for all six trigonometric functions. I'm not going to do that in this video. I'm just showing sine and cosine. But you can do this for all six trig functions, and that's how you get these ranges that you have to remember for their inverse functions. All right, so here we have the domain and range of our six inverse trigonometric functions. And I highly recommend having this in your notes somewhere, whether you copy this down or print it out or get it from somewhere else. I really recommend having this in front of you while you're doing your homework, while you're practicing. That way you'll be more likely to remember it for the exam or for quizzes and stuff. So the domain, this column I got from literally just copying down the range of the original functions. Remember, the range of the original function is the same as the domain of its inverse. And since I know what these original functions and their graphs look like, I know what the range is, and I just copy down that range into this domain. This part isn't bad, but the range is when it's tricky because the range has to do with the restricted domain of the original function. So I showed sine and cosine, and now we restrict the domain of sine and cosine so we can make them one-to-one. -one. And I can show it similarly for tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent, okay? For tangent and cotangent, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just one period. Right? If you look at the graphs for tangent and cotangent, 0 and pi for cotangent are asymptotes. And negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 are asymptotes for tangent. And between those asymptotes, the graphs pass the horizontal line test, so that works. We just take one period. It's pretty straightforward. For cosecant, it kind of lines up with its reciprocal, which is sine. The reciprocal of secant is cosine. And these kind of line up together. They're... They're similar, but the only thing we have to worry about is that asymptote in the middle. So in the middle is secant, we have pi over 2. We have to exclude pi over 2 from this range. And with cosecant, we have to exclude 0 from this range. So hopefully you have this somewhere in your notes and you can practice and memorize it because this is the key. Knowing these ranges is the key to evaluating inverse trig functions. So let's go and do some examples. Okay, so what is the sine inverse of root 2 over 2? Well, again, these Inverse trig functions take in some value and they spit out an angle, right? So what I'm really looking for here is some angle. Now I can use the definition of an inverse function, right? I can switch the input and output and write it as its original function. So this is like asking the sine of what angle gives me root 2 over 2. But there's one thing I have to remember, the range of the inverse. This angle has to be within the range of its inverse because otherwise I could come up with infinitely many angles that make this true. So I'm just going to write myself a reminder that this angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so what is this angle? Well, it's in the first quadrant and in this case theta is pi over 4. So this is a pretty straightforward example. Let's go ahead and find cosine inverse of negative root 2 over 2. So again, looking for some angle, and I can use the definition of an inverse function, okay? I can switch the input and output. So this is like asking cosine of what angle gives me root 2 over 2. But remember, that angle has to be between 0 and pi, including 0 and pi. These are both inclusive, okay? So what is this angle? Well, we have negative, which means that it's either in the second or third quadrant. But considering what my range is, we know it's actually going to be in the second quadrant. So this angle theta is actually 3 pi over 4. All right, what about sine inverse of a negative 1 half? And for some reason, I already have a theta here. Um, but yeah, we know we're looking for some angle. So I can rewrite this as sine of what angle gives me negative one half okay and remember this angle still has to be within this range so let me say questions like this are where i most commonly see mistakes a lot of mistakes are made here and i'll show you why because we look at this and we think okay quadrant four and quadrant one right that's what this range includes quadrant four and quadrant one so then we take our unit circle we look where is sine negative? Well, quadrants three or four, so this angle must be in quadrant four. Therefore, this angle is 11 pi over six, and that would actually be incorrect, right? So we are looking at the fourth and first quadrant, but here's what makes it tricky, is this fourth quadrant, it's a negative angle, so we're working backwards, right? So we're looking at negative pi over two 
to pi over two. So any angle in this fourth quadrant must be negative if it's gonna fall within our range. First quadrant, we're fine. We, can, we don't have to worry about that, right? We probably understand that, but just make sure you double check with that fourth quadrant that it is a negative angle. So in this case, it won't be 11 pi over six, but if you subtract two pi from that, you will get the correct answer, and it is actually negative pi over six, okay? So what about tangent inverse of negative root three? Well, this is some angle. So this is like asking tangent of what angle equals negative root three? And with tangent, we are between, let's see, what is tangent? Between negative pi over two and pi over two, but not including negative pi over two and pi over two. So I have negative pi over two theta pi over two. All right, so I'm looking for an angle within this range that when I plug it into tangent, I get negative root three. So I know I'm gonna be, let's see, where is tangent negative? So it would be negative in the fourth quadrant, but again, just remember, when we're in this fourth quadrant, we are between negative pi over two and zero, right? So I don't wanna wrap around this way to get my angle. I wanna come backwards this way, just remember that. So in this case, let's see, What's my reference angle for root three? I believe that's pi over three. So in this case, I'm working backwards, so this should be negative pi over three. Negative pi over three, and that's that. So hopefully this video helped. Hit like, hit subscribe. If it did, check out my channel for more videos, and stay tuned for more. I'll see you in the next video. Keep flexing those brain muscles. Keep making those brain gains.